I want to thank Joan and Craig for leading our prayers of intercession today. Well, here's a question for you. Um, not a very difficult question, but I'm going to ask. How does God speak to people today? Now, if you could speak to me at this moment, some people might say, well, you've been talking about that. It's taking God's words, opening the Bible. It's reading what he says and God, the Holy Spirit will speak to you. And indeed, there's truth in that. God does speak in that way. Individuals have come to faith, have come to trust Jesus through simply taking the word, reading it, uh, without the intervention of a human voice at all. God has spoken to them. But here Paul re is referring to his preaching, to his proclamation of the gospel. That's the, that's the central part of this. And that is still the way in which God most often speaks to people. Now, some might say, well, you know, today preaching is outmoded. Nobody's going to listen to somebody going on for 20, 30 minutes, whatever it might be. Somebody, might, uh, somebody else might say, well, look, um, this is a visual age. So you've got to add in pictures, you've got to add in videos, you've got to, to make the whole presentation more lively and therefore engage people and hold their interest. Others might say that personality is the thing. You can't remember what so-and-so said, but he had a great personality. I can't remember what my Sunday school teacher said, but she was great. And she just the way she spoke to us as children made a big impression. Well, you know, all of these things have some truth in them, but they are by no means the full picture of what's going on here. And none of them come close to what Paul is saying. It doesn't make a positive response more likely um, whenever um, the message that we communicate is foolishness to those who are perishing, just because we've added in a few pictures or a little bit of a video, or we do we communicate with a, a bit of a joke here and there thrown in. In fact, those things may only serve to distract people. So that the message is a, the, the presentation is attractive, but not the message that is communicated. And going back to 1 Corinthians, it is through the foolishness of preaching the word that people in Corinth came to trust Jesus Christ. Now, some might dispute the effectiveness today. I've made mention of that, but they, they reject preaching on flimsy evidence. When the word is met by faith, it is powerful. But let me ask you this question, because this is a bearing on it as well. When you come to church, when you tune in to an occasion such as this, how often have you prayed beforehand for the speaker that God would enable him to speak in the power of the Holy Spirit, to preach the word of God effectively, to make clear the proclamation of the word? Or when have you prayed for yourself even that you would receive the word uh, with faith and understanding. It's often said, at least in these parts, uh, it's possibly a colloquialism, that so-and-so's uh, a good salesman, he could sell snow to the Eskimos or the Inuit people as we know them today. We also know the power of a rousing speech of a good orator. We think of the like of Winston Churchill in recent history who could put nerve into the nation, who could steal um, troops on the eve of battle, who could gather support from other nations simply by the way in which he presented a speech or said something in Parliament. One of my predecessors has had that, uh, has that reputation as well, I understand, uh, as something of an orator. He was a man that people came to hear from all over Belfast. That's not happening today, of course. But the, the, effect, the effect of human persuasion is always short-lived. And it doesn't stand the test and it doesn't endure the trial. But that's not, what, not what's happening here in Thessalonica. The effect of the word, through the effect of hearing of the word, was the conversion of people. And whenever people were converted, they were moved into an enduring relationship with the living God. And the reality of that change is displayed immediately in their ability to withstand persecution. They were persecuted by their, the people around them, yet they maintained their faith. So this wasn't Paul simply harnessing all his persuasive powers, putting them all to full use and full effect. This was the word of God 
changing people's hearts. This was the word stealing people's nerve in times of persecution. The word did it all. And that's what Paul is driving at whenever we read there in verses 13 into 14. It is the word of God doing this. It is the word of God at work in people's hearts. Changing their standing before God. When it's met by faith, instructing them, encouraging them in their walk, encouraging them in their understanding of the word. And that's happening not only at the point of con conversion, when the word is met by faith. It was continuing in them the word powerful enough to give growth, um, to give understanding um, when it comes in the Spirit's power, strong enough to equip them for all the challenges that they were facing at that time. Now the word there in verse 13, which we have um, as work, is a word from which we also get the English word energy. So that here in the word is the tireless energy of God working in people's lives, effective in his, its power to change, effective in its ability to drive new passions, effective in its ability to create in the heart a love for Jesus Christ, to break habits that are destructive, to, to enable us to do away with things that are dishonouring to God. It is more than simply a self-help message. Now there was a time in my life when that um, positive self-help kind of idea was attractive to me. It was early in my career in the civil service. Somebody said to me I should be more positive about my ability and all the rest of it. And for a time it did seem to work. It seemed to communicate confidence to those people around. It's the same kind of thing that we find today when politicians get up and they don't really have a grasp of the situation. It's not really under their control, but they come across with words that are encouraging and in a bouncy kind of fashion. Um, and they instill in people a confidence that's built in flimsy grounds. We call it today boosterism. Boost people up. Well, that's not what's happening here. When you do that, you soon find that that confidence is lost whenever a challenge comes along. When people encounter failure, when they encounter opposition, if it's not built on positive grounds, if it's not built on the power of the Holy Spirit, then that is soon lost. When it's simply whipped up by positivity and the Word of God has not been effective in people's lives, then it fails. Now that's not what's happening in Thessalonica here. Because these people, because the word of God had power, they were able to face persecution and trial. So again, here's a question for you to consider. Do you in anticipation pray that you will hear the word of God with understanding? When you face coming to a service, well, it sounds like a trial, but it's not supposed to sound like that. When you consider coming to a service, when you tune in, or before you tune in to the like of this, do you ask that God the Holy Spirit would open your mind to the Word of God? And do you leave your heart open to receive His Word? Now we're going to pause again at that point. We're going to praise God again in the words of a song we know quite well uh, by Stuart Townend, You Are My Anchor. And then at the end we'll come back and consider one group who rejected the Word of God. See you in a moment.